So I now want to just say a few comments in the remaining time about um, uh, some statistical approaches, and we'll start with blind studies. You may not realize that the first person to use uh, a blind study was Benjamin Franklin. In 1784, King Louis XVI of France asked Franklin to study um, a problem he had where his people in Paris were hugging the trees in Versailles, and they were convinced it made them better, cured all their ills. And so the king didn't like that. So he asked Franklin to appoint a committee, and he did. And on that committee were all sorts of famous people, such as Guillotine of the Knife and others. And they went to the uh, Versailles and hugged the trees, this committee, and they couldn't decide whether it made any difference. So they decided to bring in volunteers, blindfold them, and give them objects to hold, some of which were tree limbs and pieces of the uh, Versailles trees. And they concluded that it didn't work. And, uh, but Franklin was phenomenally observant, and he identified the placebo effect. And this was also the discovery of the placebo effect. So the first paper, using blinded approach to do clinical research and identifying a placebo effect was done by Franklin. And the paper, I have a copy of it if anybody's interested, is, is shown here on the right. Probably didn't know that about Franklin. Now, placebo, or blinding, was uh, sort of ignored then. But a few hundred years later, um, Torald Solman, uh, who was a great uh, uh, statistician, suggested a placebo control and blinded observer might be a solution to investigator bias. And that was about 1930. And then, of course, blindfold tests were widely used uh, by advertisers and consumers groups in the 1930s and 1940s. The first use of statistics uh, was a borrowed idea, uh, borrowed from Sir Ronald Almer Fisher, who uh, applied statistics for agriculture use and introduced the application of statistics in experimental design. And for farming and plant fertility, the concept of randomizations and analysis of variance were developed by him, and then it was later applied to medicine. The first modern example of a controlled clinical trial was done by Sir Austin Bradford in 1948, who did a study to show that streptomycin was an effective drug for pulmonary tuberculosis. This was a beautiful study and clearly showed the importance of a randomized control group to prove that streptomycin was an effective therapy for TB. Okay, medical ethics. There's a, you've probably heard of Gerhard Hansen, who discovered the cause of leprosy in 1874. But this claim was not well received at the time and he became desperate to prove that it really was the cause of leprosy. So without telling some nurses, he inoculated them with live leprosy bacillus, and he gave them leprosy. And he was sued, and he lost. And he was removed from his position, but for reasons that aren't completely clear, he was so well recognized in his institution that he was allowed to still work. But he committed what would be considered a grave violation of ethical principles. In 1898, William Osler, at a meeting, uh, said to Giuseppe Santarelli, who had discovered the etiologic agent for yellow fever and did somewhat similar to what Hansen did, he injected this agent into volunteers without telling them and gave them yellow fever. He said to deliberately inject a poison of known high degree of virulency into a human being unless you obtain a man's consent is criminal. And that was the end of Santorelli's career, unlike Hansen. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of informed consent. And um, I'm going to jump ahead to 1953, the day uh, shortly, that within days of the clinical center opening here at NIH, when the 
medical board in their very first meeting under uh, Dr. Luther Terry, who was chair of that board, said that they had to provide each patient with a reasonable understanding of his role in a study project and the means of obtaining evidence for such understanding and consent. And this policy at the clinical center um, had a big effect. It had a big effect on Congress uh, and the Harris, Kiefer Harris Amendment to the FDA's uh, law stipulated that subjects must be told whether a drug is being used for investigational purposes. And the United States Surgeon General uh, issued an, uh, a policy saying that any federal money used uh, to support research uh, using drug development uh, required review by an institutional review board to make sure that it was ethical. And that was on all public health service grants. In 1967, relatively recently, the FDA required all new drug sponsors obtain informed consent for use of investigational drugs in humans. Now, you're going to hear about ethics and the history of ethics from Christine Grady and others, and you'll, you'll, you'll learn more about the background and um, current policies. So this is my last slide, and I wanted to leave you with the message, if you haven't figured it out, that the business of clinical research has been an international uh, business with great people, literally in every culture, and uh, we're all the beneficiaries of that. And what we do today, I think, is just capitalizing on what an awful lot of people have done before us.